Welcome. Thanks for being here. This is a, a panel on the use of video, making professional learning visible, the use of video, um, to create reflection and collaborative coaching. Our panelists are all to my right, so I want to do a quick introduction, and then they're going to take it away in just a few minutes and dazzle you with their knowledge. But Catherine Prokop is the head of school at Howard University in Math and Science Middle School. Paul Freeman, superintendent at Guilford Public Schools. Thanks for being here. And Claire Goglin is the MQI Coaching Program Manager at Harvard's Center for Education and Policy Research. All three of these folks are practitioners who are using video deeply, um, engaged in their work. And so what I want to do is shape the conversation really around a, a kind of a few themes. Number one, we're, I'm going to share some data and some slides with you real quick, just about kind of creating the case for video. And then I'm just going to ask you all to jump in and share your experiences, both kind of the, the trials and the tribulations, as well as the successes of using video. So as we think about this work, we know good teachers are what matter most, right? And we've talked about this a lot today, and I think we've probably talked about it a lot every day. But what we you know, know, too, is that teachers, by and large, don't feel like they're getting the type of feedback they need to make those improvements. And you can see the data we collected through Smart Brief. Only 30% of teachers say they get meaningful and timely feedback. And only about 38% of school leaders feel like the feedback systems and evaluation systems are, are working to improve practice. Yeah, it's a little bit alarming, right? Because we know we need to grow every teacher, and we want every teacher to have that opportunity, but when fewer than a third are growing, you know, it kind of gives us pause and helps us really start to reevaluate what's that support look like and how do we build it effective systems of support. We also know that your districts and every district across the country, we're trying a bunch of things and s seeing what works. Um, some of these you know, are newer types of, of, of initiatives. Some have been tried and true uh, and tested, and you know, some are quite frankly, have been deemed to be not so valid, like kind of traditional set and get PD, but we do it anyways, because that's how we're structured to do the work. And so what I want this conversation to do is really push our thinking around, what does PD really look like? When we talk about professional learning and coaching, does it have to look like it's always looked? Or are there ways that we might start to rethink it and re-engage in the conversation to, to make it look and feel different? The other thing we know, and this is research that came out of the New Teacher Project last year, we know that districts are spending a lot of time and money doing this. If you're a teacher, you know, like a lot of your time is spent in PD that may or may not feel effective, and many times, like my example, it's not. Um, and districts are spending, and this number was alarming to me, between six and $18,000 per year per teacher on professional learning. It's a lot of money. If you multiply that by the millions of teachers in this country, we're spending a lot of money on this work and not getting a lot of bank for a buck or bucks, right? Um, the data is also showing us that teachers don't feel like it's working. Fewer than half teachers say their professional development is tailored to their context, and fewer than a third show any growth. So there's room to improve. There's room to improve around professional learning, and we want to think now creatively about how to kind of fill the gap and, and engage in, in deeper reflection about what is actually working. Harvard and Brown recently, and not, not so recent anymore, I guess it was 2016, put out a study in which they assert that coaching is one of the most effective methods for professional learning. If you've been a coach or you coach, you probably are nodding your head at this point. I felt this as a coach too. Um, because it's, it checks some of the boxes that traditional p professional development doesn't check, right? It tends to be more job embedded, tends to be more continuous and ongoing. We tend to have more frequent touch points than a few days in the summer and a few days throughout the school year. Um, but what we also know is that there are a lot of challenges associated with coaching. It's hard to scale. Um, it's hard to get visibility into the coach's work. When I was a coach, my coaching was very much kind of, I had a notebook, I watched teachers teach, and we had feedback conversation, but no one ever told me I was doing a good job or a bad job as a coach. You know, it was mostly based on gut, and no one was ever coaching me as a coach, too. And I think one of the challenges in this work always is, we assume that every, you know, the teachers are the only ones who need to grow, and you know, what I would suggest is, we all have room to grow. So we gotta think about how we're coaching coaches, and how we're coaching school leaders. And these challenges start to, put themselves up in front of us quite quickly in this work, and so sometimes it's easier not to go down certain roads. We also know that coaching is particularly expensive to do it well, and the logistics get in the way. Because it's, you know, content coaching matters, so when you're talking about the secondary level, putting one coach at every high school, it's generally not that effective, because they probably have deep expertise in one content area, but not the others. I remember as a school leader, trying to evaluate my French teacher. 
I don't know French, right? And she had one of those philosophies where she taught everything in French. So I sat in the back of the room, and I gave her feedback around things like classroom management, and that was it. I never, like, she could have been teaching all French wrong, for all I knew, and I just had to nod my head and, and go. She would have much, had much more benefit from a coach who knew how to teach French. Um, so video is allowing us to start to connect folks with content in ways that we probably can't if we're trying to do everything in person. Tom Kane, someone I deeply admire, given his work in this space, particularly around teacher effectiveness, um, ha has been a part of the leadership around the project Visibly Better, which everyone at this panel knows about. Claire and Catherine are on the um, advisory board for Visibly Better, and we'll talk a little bit about this, and I'll ask you to share some experience. We have some resources um, for you to take uh, relative to this project. But I'm on the working group, and we're all in a meeting, and the first thing he laid out was this claim that in order to move practice, we need to engage teachers in deliberate practice. And his assertion is, he doesn't think it's possible without video. So he's gone on the record now saying that without video, it might not be, we might not be capable of moving practice in the, in the way that we think uh, we should be. And for some of the same reasons that we just pointed out. So it's led us down this road to really think about how do we want to improve practice. The other thing I find uh, startling and sometimes, uh, like. Uh, you know, a little challenging to comprehend relative to this work is when we ask people if they think video would improve their practice, overwhelmingly they say yes. Teachers at a rate of 91% believe that filming their practice would help them improve. School leaders, 85%. We even asked, started to ask questions around evaluation. We found 80% of teachers would be open to using video for evaluation, which we didn't expect. And as we started to unpack it, we realized because what you have when you have videos, you have evidence of practice, you have a, a piece of video to have a conversation around. Um, there's so many kind of benefits that come from the video, the, the, the act of kind of using video in, the, in this work that really matter and start to kind of take root for teachers. So with that and that ground laying introduction, I want to, um, why don't we do this first? Why don't, if you, three of you don't mind, give us a quick rundown of how you're using video. So when you think about the use of video, how are you using it? Catherine, you want to start? Hi. I always get nervous of, at this question, so I have to preface it before I answer. I, our, our school is a single site LEA, so we are kind of responsible to ourselves. We do have some oversight in the city, so the things that we do, I have a lot of flexibility. So to answer the question, we use video totally for evaluation. Well, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into the, what that looks I'll like. We'll get into that later, but yeah. I, I needed to give you that first because otherwise you'd be like, how did you do this? So that was... Great. Paul? So in Guilford schools, we're using video completely divorced from evaluation. Um, we have been working for a short time with our instructional coaches who have been capturing video primarily for their own professional development and teachers are part of that. We need to see the coaches working with teachers, but they're using the video in their PLCs to improve their teaching. Some teachers have become more comfortable being on video and coaches are now beginning to branch out and use the, the video to assist the coaches as well. What we launched this year that I'm particularly excited about is that we've started using video with every one of our principals, recognizing that teachers are hesitant to use video to grow. All of the principals in Guilford schools are required to use a video platform to capture video of themselves working with teachers and to reflect on that video and then they and I talk about those experiences. We want the coaches modeling that growth mindset and that, that disposition. Um, we want the principals modeling that disposition and that's where we are with video at this point, completely separate from the evaluative process. Um, and we started in strictly a research context. So we were collecting video to answer a variety of research questions, both sort of what's happening in classrooms in the US and also whether certain interventions resulted in changes in practice. And so we actually ended up in the professional learning sphere kind of by accident because all of the people who were doing the viewing of video for our research studies started to report back, this is really transforming how I teach, it's completely changing everything about how I see myself, my instruction. And so now we work with mathematics teachers and coaches, and we work with them on using video to guide their professional growth in a content-specific way. So I do mostly math, um, 
but we also train coaches and we like other folks have said there's this parallel process where if we expect teachers to film themselves working with students we expect our coaches to film their work with teachers and we film our work with coaches as well so what's surprised you the most about using video and real quick how new are you all to kind of the use of video so when did you start the work specifically with video it's been, uh, this is 2018-19, so since 2016. And I think the thing that surprised me most was how open the teachers were to it. So at first, so I need to preface how we got into where we are. Um, I'm sure you all recognize or remember that those times of year when it's time for formal evaluations and you're doing that pre-meeting with the teacher and you're looking at the lesson plan and you go in and you see their dog and pony show and then you have that conversation with them afterwards. And maybe if you sit next to a student, they whisper in your ear, this is not what they really do anyway, right? <laughs> so at after having done enough of those and recognizing that it was stupid for lack of a better term and it really wasn't helping the teacher and it was just giving me a box to check we got i tripped over insight and we decided to use video so when we introduced it at first the teacher was like and then it was like okay this is and when we we positioned it such that this is to help you get better and so once they saw that it wasn't a gotcha or i'm just trying to see what you're doing but really want to use it to help you get better um it became like the norm for the classroom and so it's the norm now you wouldn't go in one of our classes and not see somebody videotaping something so i think initially you know just making sure that it wasn't something that was being used as a a tool to hurt but a, a something to actually help once we got past that it was really easy to, to implement did it take a long time to get past that it's a trust level it really is it's about how where do you where the conversation that you have with teachers with the similar to what you described is the whole goal is to improve their instructional practice and ultimately improve student outcomes so when you know that that's how you're positioning it and they can see that that's truly what you believe then it's easy thanks so we've been using it um, with the coaches in the district going into our third year um, I watched the coaches using the tool with teachers and decided that that was something that I wanted to use with the principals and it is my first year individually using that as a tool with the principals. Um, what I was immediately surprised with was that the principals were nervous sharing those videos with me. And so when I said that I want you over the course of this year to share three videos with me, they began capturing themselves two and three times reflecting on it and then deciding they didn't want to share that with me, so they went back and got another one. So for the three videos that I've asked them to collect, I've got principals who are tracking to do a dozen videos. And with each one, they're going back and they're sharing with me that, you know, this wasn't what I thought I was doing, but I am reflecting and viewing myself and it, it levered their self-motivation to, to look and reflect more. And principals don't often get to a be, right, you don't often see a principal's work. They never get to see their own work. So the level of enthusiasm is what has surprised me. Seven principals who are excited to be doing this, even though they still groan every time they send me one. They just don't like the way they look or sound on video, but they're enjoying the activity. Yeah, I think some similar things. Um, oh, we started, I guess I first used video in a research context in 2010, so it's been almost 10 years, but in terms of working directly with teachers on professional growth, 2013 or 14, so more like five years um, in the PD and coaching world. And I think the, the thing that I continue to see more of each year is those parallels at the different levels in the system. So um, the parallels between teachers work with students and coaches work with teachers and principals work with teachers and Anyone who's coaching anyone else, uh, there's so much similarity at all those levels in the system, and it's not fair to only focus on one level and ignore the others. So I think I, I didn't know how many of those parallels were there until I continued to see more and more. What's been the biggest challenge? You want to start? Sure. I mean, early on technology. Yeah. I mean, it was horrible. We were mailing SD cards around the country, collecting video from <laughs> teachers because the upload didn't work. and. 
Some of it was that the, the cameras and the online platforms weren't very well developed yet, and some of it is just that schools are not always equipped with the newest hardware or the best Wi-Fi, and so, or they have just really strict firewalls and teachers can't download the app they need to do the thing they want to do, and so there were just a lot of tech hurdles, and those are getting fewer each year. It's getting much, much, much smoother, and so each time we do it, it's easier than the time before, um, but definitely figuring out the initial, the initial technology rollout was for sure our biggest challenge at the beginning. Um, the, the platform, the advanced platform, has made the technology piece really simple for us. And so um, even our, I'll just, our, our oldest principal is doing fine with it, right? He's not struggling. The guy, who had a flip, <laughs> the guy who still had a flip phone when I came to district is doing fine with it. Um, for us, it's just still the idea of being camera shy. And, and again, for us, it's important that we're modeling this behavior to the larger community. Um, it's exciting to know that just do it and they'll be fine. Um, but we're, we're still in the process of telling people that it's not evaluative, it's about self-growth, self it's about the growth mindset, and just encouraging people to just take a leap, enjoy it, and not, don't be nervous about being on camera. There's also something interesting about starting with coaches or school leaders, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the, they're, the, they're the ones receiving the feedback. It's really easy to get feedback. Right? It's not so easy to receive feedback. Um, and so, so I think you know, what's nice about videos is it allows you to I wonder if you're finding this, allows them to kind of get in the learner's seat, which makes them kind of approach the work differently when they're actually with the one who would do the coaching. Well, and so the phrase that we stumbled onto using with that group was the idea of being confidently vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? It's, right, I'm the principal. I'm always supposed to be in that position of being in control, but now I'm catching video. And then the other piece is that the, the reflection, the idea was that you're, re you're looking for things both to refine and things that you just want to reinforce. So with each reflection, what are the things that worked well? I really push them. The first couple of videos, all I got was self-criticism from the principals. And so I actually would send it back and say, I want you to find something you did well. I want you to find something that you liked and you want to do more of. And it, I, it was that combination of those words, um, you know, reinforce, um, refine, but also that idea about it's okay to be vulnerable and you can still be confident and be vulnerable at the same time. I think the first challenge for us was who was going to do it because we sent the coaches and the administrators in to do the video and then we got the same thing we got if we had done a regular evaluation because it was us and so we realized that okay this is we don't want something staged we want you to feel comfortable so we told the teachers you do it use your phone we had the technology so tell us how to set it up and what you need and when they realized oh you're not yep i'm just going to see your regular class that's that great. made it go a lot faster, a lot easier. Um, again, like you said, as soon as they saw it, I was horrible. <laughs> All right, yeah. I had one teacher was concerned that her physical appearance, like yes. I'm not looking at that, but that was concerned. She thought she looked fat on the video. <laughs> <laughs> we get that a lot. Yeah, we get I mean, yes, that's a lot of the, the feedback. That's a so lot much. of the nervousness. I'm yes. Like, I'm like, so or I hate my voice. That's another one I get a lot. <laughs> so, but it was once they did it. Um, like you said, we start getting. It's the the issue we have now is sometimes we have too many. It's like, okay, too many what? Videos. Okay. Because teachers will say. I need you to see this lesson, or I don't think this one went well, and so I keep, you'll get it, even pop, 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 please look at this because I really want to get this better. So it's really become part of the culture. Yeah, part of just what, what you should know about the, the platform is teachers control their own videos. Mm -hmm. So there's no Big Brother happening, as, and that's by design, because the, the goal is to really engage teachers and taking more ownership of their professional learning. And so what you're experiencing too is like, you have to watch your own video to decide what you want to submit. Yeah, I had a principal recently who said something quite similar. It's like, I feel like this teacher is gaming the system. So why do you say that? He said, because I know she built, films a few videos before I get one. And I was like, I love it. <laughs> and because she's doing exactly what you said, right? She's reflecting on her own practice, making those improvements on her own. Then you spend your time kind of with the stuff she didn't catch. Right. Um, so, and the frequency, the other stuff that the, you know, the other data is suggesting too that frequency really matters and the amount of coaching people gets really matters too and so if we try to impose video but stick with the same paradigm of once every six weeks you're going to get an observation and feedback that's not enough frequency to actually impact practice and i think the new teacher center's most recent research suggests that teachers need three to four hours of coaching a month 
That's an hour a week. It's a lot of coaching, right? How many of you are coaches? Yeah, can you imagine trying to give every teacher in the building an hour a week? Right, but, but they might get an hour a week if one week they're doing self-reflection and they're sharing videos peer to peer, right? So we gotta break, also break down the silos of what, how we define coach. So I'm curious to know if like, how has that worked when you define coach or coaching? Has it changed the definition of coaching or how you approach coaching? I mean, our early experience, right, and these are just leading indicators, but the early experience is, is it's giving them the ability to, to have a little autonomy and be a little self-directed because they are choosing to capture videos, look at them themselves, and there is some cross-sharing that's happening across peers. So they're, you know, the elementary principals are catching a video and sharing it with their colleagues before deciding if they want to share it with me on the platform. And the idea that they want to be self-directed in their reflection and learning it, more power to you, right? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic that they want to be self-driven and improve on their own. Um, doesn't take me out of the process, but I don't have to micromanage the whole process. Yeah. And I think it supports the coaches as well because what happens is, like you said, if a content area teacher, I have a math teacher who's been teaching for a thousand years and, and he loves video and he loves to share his video and he share, we share a lot of his video with our newer teachers but it actually helps our coach because he'll say to the coach, you know, I shared this video with so-and-so and I know you're coaching her and this is one of the things she's looking at and so the coach has some additional information to use to help that teacher and it kind of whittles that time down. The other thing is with coaching, you're physically in there, you're seeing the teacher, you're meeting with the teacher, and to try and do that an hour a week, depending on what your coaching load is, is almost impossible, but you can watch videos at home and kind of like, okay, and with insight is, I'm really not a commercial, I'm getting no money <laughs> for this conversation, I just need you to know, um, but insight really allows you to go in and look put your feedback and then turn on Netflix. I mean, it's really that cool. So um, it really changes the, the playing field of who's actually coaching and makes the coach's life a lot easier. It's a good quote. Give your feedback and then turn on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, we've um, found that, well, one of the things I've learned is that when someone comes up to me and says I'm a coach, I have to ask a lot of follow-up questions before I understand anything about their job. Some coaches are mostly responsible for looking at data and then reporting back and expecting that teachers to make their own decisions about what to do with that. Other coaches work with three to four teachers in a grade level or subject area. Other people are responsible for 350 teachers in a massive district. So the types of things that they are able to do is really going to vary depending on the realities of their job and the job title coach is incredibly nonspecific. Um, and so when we first started doing our research, we had hired and trained our own coaches to, to very prescriptively do the process that we wanted to study. It mattered for our research that it was all very tightly controlled. Um, and then when it was going well, we said, oh, well, we should also offer this as a service, you know, at cost to places that want it where we're not doing research. And very quickly we found that the demand was occasionally for direct video-based coaching from our experts, but more often for training for their coaches. Um, because I have math coaches coming up to me all the time and saying, I am a great math teacher and I just got this coaching job and nobody's ever been a coach in my school before and there's no structure, there's no training, right. there's no support. Right. I don't have that, that's a different skill set. Like being an excellent math teacher is not the same skill set as coaching a, math, a different math teacher to get better. And so there is a real demand out there for supports for coaches. And so that's one of the things that we've developed based on that demand is like routines to help coaches. And we define that loosely. It could be mentor teachers, it could be department heads, it could be instructional coaches, it could be administrators who also evaluate anyone who's giving feedback to another teacher for how to have that conversation. Well, and that's, that's what's happening for us. And I may be contributing to muddying the term a little bit further because I'm not a coach. In fact, I, we're a small school district, so I directly supervise the principals. But this allows me to do that in more of a coaching way, right? Um, if I've got the right principals on board, I should be their coach. I shouldn't be uh, an eval I shouldn't be deciding are you making the cut or not. I should be helping you to develop and grow. And I feel that this allows me to to supervise in more of a coaching way. Yeah. But it doesn't change. You know, I'm I'm still the evaluator at the end of yeah. the day. So, so you've already tiptoed into this question, but 
How is, what's been the impact on the culture of professional learning? And I, I want to kind of take that question two ways. Kind of in your own context, how are you seeing professional learning look and feel different? Probably from your perspective and maybe from the perspective of the, those you support. Let's start there, actually. So, professional development is a pet peeve of mine because we, we have it, um, we decide what we're, this is what we used to do, and we decide what we're gonna present and it's, you know, here is classroom management and, and here is lesson planning, whatever it is. And it all seems to be the same flavor and then we say, okay, go away and do well. Um, and then they don't, or somebody does. So we, in looking at this and, and with the videos, it has changed it dramatically. So first we're able, teachers are able to tell us just by looking at their own video where they think they need some assistance. So they're actually guiding their own coaching, guiding their own professional development, um, and helping us determine, okay, hey, we're gonna put some training in here for you, or why don't you take a look at this particular teacher? So it really has allowed us to personalize it more for the teacher. And then what we've also developed is we've got a library of really great practices that are going on inside the school that teachers are able to access anytime they want. Because you all know if you've all taught a class, you know you had that one that you really rocked, right? It just, you just felt good after it was over. Right. So if you had that video and it's there and I'm getting ready to teach a similar lesson and I can go and pull that down and how much more meaningful is it for me, you're in the same building that I'm in and I'm seeing my colleague doing something well and I can actually use that as part of my development or when it's time and we're having that conversation about what training do you need, you say, you know, I saw teacher X do this and while this is great, I need training in that too. So this has allowed us to help our teachers develop their own plan instead of us just shoving something at them because we think is what they need. Yeah, I think similarly, video allows um, it to be less combative or defensive. The teacher sees their own practice and overwhelmingly they are self-critical at first, like yes. too much actually, but mm -hmm. they immediately jump to, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that, I can't believe, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 they're specific. They say things like, I thought I gave a lot of wait time, mm -hmm. and then I watched the video and I realized I answered my own question immediately. Yep. Um, and so it just allows her people to have a different lens to their own practice, and then, then they believe in and buy into the changes that they want to make, and then they see whether or not it worked. You know, they film again. And so I think that there's that teacher ownership piece and also that follow through. Mm -hmm. It's not just once. Um, and it, you, you can see over time where you are now and what you're working on. And I think that for us, the other thing that we do is we keep the focus pretty narrow. Mm -hmm. um, we don't try to tackle everything at once. There's too many possible things you could talk about when you look at video of instruction. And so we sort of pick a goal or an area of focus and we talk just about that. Um, and we don't try to bring in every possible way that a teacher could have done better. We stick to one thing at one time, and then when they're ready, we move on to the next thing. Yeah, so I think it's absolutely sort of um, making the, the self-critique sharper and more honest, right? The, for, for many of the early videos that we've picked up, it is a principal working with one teacher. They're doing a debrief on a lesson um, because it's easy to capture. It's easy to set up the camera and get that two, that two shot. Um, but what the principals are saying is the way that I'm actually debriefing with these teachers isn't the way I thought, right? They, they all think I go in and I ask a lot of probing questions and then they look and they immediately say, I'm not asking as many questions as I thought I was asking. So the way they remembered it and the way that they saw it is very, very different. I also see that it seems to be bridging the gaps in between other other coaching or evaluative or professional learning sessions. It seems to be making it more ongoing because what's happening is that the videos are dropping in um, at odd times. Nobody's, nobody's videoing on the same schedule. And so um, in between where I might have met with the principal and then met with them again two weeks later, they're dropping me a video. And then when they, one principal had this great sort of observations about his own interactions and his own body language. I mean, the thing that he noticed was he wasn't making eye contact with the teacher and 
he really wasn't listening to her answers. He had five questions that he wanted to ask, and he was just letting her talk while he was waiting to go on to the next one. So after seeing his feedback, I just dropped a couple TED Talks into the resource section, without naming him, sent an email out to the whole team, and just said, after a video exchange with one of you, I'd like to encourage you all to take a look. And you know, one TED Talk was Celeste Headley on how to have a good conversation, and I think one was Amy Cuddy on body language. I said, take a look at these two. They were specific for him, but why not encourage everybody to take a look at those two videos? And so it's creating this continuous conversation rather than you know one shot pieces across the school year we've seen something really similar with our coaches and with teachers um, which is that often coaching conversations and teaching are really isolated you don't see other people practice and so not only do you get a chance to look at video of yourself but you also get a look a chance to look at video of your colleagues and again this is owned you know, with the permission of the teacher or coach who's sharing that video, um, we share in our communities of professionals and they can learn a lot from seeing what other coaches do well or other teachers do well and also areas for growth in other teachers or other coaches and um, sort of actually just the skill of looking at video and noticing things gets better. <laughs> um, and so you get, you sort of get a more critical eye and then a shared language in a community if you're working on it together. So you just also see a lot more. Yeah, I talk about a lot in terms of formative versus summative. Mm -hmm. I think we're really good at summative observations and coaching, right? That happens mm -hmm. kind of at these intervals. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think has been exciting about watching this develop is we're seeing a lot more teachers now have the summative in-person coaching conversation. And out of that conversation typically comes, here are a few things you could work on in the next transitions, right? Or your warm-up took 20 minutes, which means it's not a warm-up. That's a lesson, right? So let, let's focus on the warm-up. Next week, film, film your warm up and drop it in. And right. so they're taking 15 minute clips or 20 minute clips. And so they're, they're, the interactions become much more frequent. Yeah. And that's how growth happens, right? It's not gonna happen once every six weeks. It's gonna happen when we do it once every six days or kind yeah. of when these, and a 15 minute video clip is probably easier mm -hmm. for you to watch, right? Absolutely. And kind of comment on and timestamp and do all those good things. And then you send it back and all of a sudden that conversation continues and you don't have to leave your office or you did it at home. Or, so it makes it just more accessible. I'm curious to know uh, if you think it's improving instruction. So what I'm hearing is it feels like it's probably moving the needle on professional learning. The whole goal of professional learning is to improve instruction at the end of the day. So, so is it or kind of where's the potential in terms of improving instruction and, and how do you think you might get a window into whether or not it's working? I can go first on that one. We have research <laughs> that says it does. There you go. Um, and so there are you're Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> there's some meta analyses where that sort of summarize a lot of different research studies that say coaching, um, and this is a, a number of different kinds of coaching, but coaching um, has a much higher probability of actually changing practice than other types of professional learning. And in our experience, we did a randomized controlled trial of ours, and we did the so we recruited teachers, we randomly assigned them to either receive the coaching or not. For one year, we coached the teachers who got randomly assigned to that, did not coach the control teachers. And then it was a year later that we filmed video and collected it to analyze what happened. And in the next year, not even when they were receiving coaching, it was a pretty sizable, statistically significant difference in the quality of the instruction of the teachers who received coaching. So not only did it change the next day, but a year later when they no longer had a coach, it was still there. And so, to, and, and we see it. <laughs> so like, I have data that says it changes practice and also you can just see when you work with the same teacher over the course of a year, mm -hmm. it's really visible. I mean, so we don't have data. It's, real, it's very new for us. We don't have local data. Um, but the, the simple intuitive piece is, Follow the money, right? Big sports have been, right? We, we borrowed the term coaching from, from the athletic world because yep. we knew that coaching worked in the places where people really make money and get famous. Mm -hmm. And now for us to be adopting video makes sense because elite athletes have always used video to improve their performances. And so for us to borrow those practices um, from, other, from other professions just to me makes all the sense in the world. I still get challenged from the Board of Education who thinks coaching doesn't sound professional enough. They don't think that's the right term. They'd like to call them embedded professional developers. 
but the word coach to me has all the positive connotations that we want. It's about observation and feedback and partnership in the work. It's so much more positive than the word evaluator or professional developer. No, I want somebody to partner with me and coach me. Um, it's, it's just the right thing to do, I think. I think when you talk about improving instruction, people think immediately about assessments. You think about how are children doing. And so we, if I look at, I have a brand new teacher and in September, I was afraid that I was gonna have to teach this math class, it was that bad. And so it was, but she was new. I mean, mm -hmm. she was really new. And so we started with the video and when I showed the video, she cried. I was crying too, but I was. <laughs> and so we came to some kind of consensus of what we needed to do and what kind of coaching she needed. So over time, we just did a recent one with her and she, I, I had the tissues, I was ready, but it was so much better. But it, there were two things that I noticed. First, the scores of her children when they started were abysmal. We did our winter scores, they were much better. But that really wasn't it. We have one, you know, you know that kid that crawls the walls all the time. So we had this kid, he's a wall crawler, and he was in her room, and she could not, she didn't know how to manage it, nothing, the whole, her whole thing was just all over the place. So when we looked at the video again, I was specifically looking for this kid, because I'm like, okay, have you changed your practice so that he's okay? Because that to me shows some improvement in your instruction and your practice. He was helping somebody else. So somehow she, through her uh, observations of herself after she got out of the tears, she recognized that, okay, and our coaching her, she got better, and because she got better, so did he. So, and then we used that with the parent too, so it was really awesome. But that was, it was, um, that to me is improving instruction. So yes, you're gonna have the data, the kids get better, but are the kids better in the class? So they can show you on a test, but there's more to it than that. And you can see that because her practice got better, her children liked being in the classroom. And that's a lot about what instruction is. I can't teach you if you don't want to be there to learn. And she got better because she gained confidence and she got the coaching that she needed. I have more questions, but I want to see if there are any questions right now from the, from the room. Tell me a little bit about the challenges with the principals. I mean, how do you start this? So the large group conversation, an individual conversation? Because imagine that the principal would be more scared than the teachers. Imagine the teacher would go for it. Mm -hmm. For principal, uh, I guess they would be a little more hurtful. So uh, we launched it at our summer retreat and in fact um, the principals had all been exposed to it because the principals each had coaches in their buildings who were using the video platform, at, right, the coaching cadre was already using it. So they'd all been exposed to it. Um, at the summer retreat, um, we talked, uh, at every summer retreat we sort of shape the work moving forward, the way that we want to con shape our year. We sort of write a, a theory of action every year. I introduced the platform and I said that I want to bring the video into our practice and it was essentially put out as here's the platform I'm providing the tool for you and I am I'm asking you you know it's framed as an ask but it's not really an ask I'm asking you each <laughs> to collect three videos over the course of the year and then the assistant superintendent and I already had one queued up she had already done this so the first thing that we did was we were able to then show them a video of the assistant superintendent working with one of the coaches whom she supervises so it was almost mirrors within mirrors right here was the coach who'd been using the video here's the assistant superintendent and we were able to model the the platform insight is incredibly helpful in then providing tech support so we did a webinar uh, with insight to show each of them how to use the tool and then it was live and and what I told them was this is in no way part of the evaluative process it's something we're gonna do this year but it doesn't blend into your I, I'm still in the classrooms I'm still visiting the schools I still shadow them for an entire evaluate a traditional evaluation cycle but this is extra and then at 
the end of that summer retreat, those three days together when we wrote our theory of action for the year, it starts with the phrase, using video as a prism through which we will view our own practice. And then it goes on to talk about those things that we're hoping to move the needle on this year. So it was about sort of softly launching it. We've been working on growth mindset for, a, for years now. So it was there as part of be willing to fail. And that's where the term confidently vulnerable came out. That yes, you may not like how you look on video. You're not going to like the sound of your voice but it's just you and me looking at it. Nobody else has to see it if you choose for it just to be between the two of us. Um, and then they started even filtering that. They're doing two and three catches before they share one with me. Um, so it was a soft launch, but they got behind it and they were excited about it. Thanks. Okay, I just have a follow-up to that. Did you have them submit anything else besides a coaching conversation with a, with a teacher, any other videos? Uh, the, the, um, so we encourage them to use it for anything they want. And in fact, there's one specific principal who I have really encouraged to do it while he's running a larger meeting, either a PLC or in fact, I'd like to do a, a faculty meeting mm -hmm. because he talks too much, mm -hmm. right? For him, it's about the ratio of talk. Mm -hmm. So the one-on-one the -on -one conversations are easy to catch from a logistical point of view, um, but I've told them any piece of your work that you want to review and then share with me, you, as, if you can figure it out, you can do anything in the print. I, I said I want it to be about teaching and learning, right? I don't want to see you in the lunchroom. I don't want to see your bus dismissal, mm -hmm. but if it's about teaching and learning any piece of the work that you do and there's that one specific principal who is going to do a, a faculty meeting because I want to see that he's talking less and letting the, and letting the team work more funny for me to tell somebody to talk less but that's that's a goal we're working on I'm gonna Paul I know I'm gonna pull up your theory of action just so people oh. can see it yeah just thinking we, we ask and, and request for teachers, administrators to videotape certain aspects of what's going on, teaching and learning. As superintendents, do you, do you allow for yourself to be video during a pre-evaluation or mid-year evaluation or evaluation period just to get feedback from peers? So um, I have put video of myself in front of our leadership team. So totally fair question, right? Yes. So I've gone ahead and share, and I asked one of the principals, would you be comfortable with me capturing this and sharing this? And we, we shared it at a leadership team meeting, and the whole team was able to critique the exchange that we had. I haven't done it with, with superintendent colleagues, and it would be fascinating to use it with that sort of PLC as well. And the reason I asked with peers uh, is because I don't know how authentic the feedback would be <laughs> if you're doing it with your support. So, yep. Uh, sharing it with peers, and I'm sure you have a circle of friends that you sit and talk with and uh, you share back and forth, just allowing them to do it and give you feedback as to what they see or what you may not see because you're in the act up. The same as it is yep. for everyone else. So I think after that we should exchange email addresses and we can, yeah, right? That, it would absolutely, it would be, right, in a, in a way for me to interact with peers who don't work in Connecticut schools. I think it's a great idea. Well, yep. I, I ask because uh, we have someone who videotapes our principal meetings mm -hmm. and I never thought about it until just listening. And I said, you know, I probably should look at the video mm -hmm. and see if I talk to <laughs> you. <laughs> if you're a superintendent, I can almost guarantee that you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. So, um, you know, the, the images to the right of the video, um, we, we washed out a lot of content, but that circle on the far right, that is Fullen's um, circle about coherence. Mm -hmm. And all the principals in our district would recognize that without necessarily needing to have the words on there. The Venn diagram um, is a graphic we've used in district. It refers to three high leverage instructional practices that we want to see in every classroom at every grade level. They would absolutely recognize that. And the piece in the middle 
is uh, Schoenfeld's true framework, teaching for robust understanding. Uh, the umbrella is a local image that we use to create challenging but supportive classrooms. It's around, it's around anxiety. And so our principals would look at that, recognize what each of those components reflects upon, and then right, we're gonna use video to make sure that we're leveraging um, a, 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 an improving climate and, and professional practices and instructional practices at the classroom level. Other questions? Can I ask more about the management of watching the, the clips? You kind of mentioned before that you can watch it at home and watch some, some Netflix mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. do that. Um, I have a couple of coaches who are piloting this, and, and they're feeling the, the bulk of the videos as excitement has organically mm -hmm. gone through the building. So can you talk about how you organically or systematically set it up so that you can manage the video watching? And, and so we, we've got lots of people how can I so when they come okay so our teachers have mentors and coaches throughout the building and so when the videos are there there's a you have time so this is your planning time this is your coaching time and the nice part about it is you don't have to watch all of it like you can slide through and and one of the the wonderful part uh, things about um advanced feedback is we decide what we're looking for. So I don't want you to imagine an hour long video and you have to go, it's not that, it's clips of things. And so you decide like, okay, I'm looking at video at this time because I know I'm gonna have a conversation with this teacher. So it's really no different from if you went in and did an observation, wrote down all your feedback, put it all together and then got ready to meet with a teacher. This is actually faster because you're kind of looking and things you might just want to slide through because that's not what I was looking for. And um, it just makes it, it's really, it's faster than you think it is, but a lot of them go because they want you to see them all. And so sometimes it's like, okay, this is what we are focusing on. We were focusing on transitions. So which video am I looking for for transitions? Or we're looking at your warm-up, or we're looking at your small group work. So you sent me something that had to do with this. Can we push this one to the side right now? Because this was what I was, our focus was for this particular week or month. So it's really a conversation with the teacher and then you're managing your time too. And then it's also about, because I want to see all of it. So it's kind of like structuring and, and disciplining yourself to focus on that piece that you're really coaching them for. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that and add that when we, our coaches usually the first time they're processing video, it takes a long time. And we say, yes, that's great, that's fine. Take as long as you need the first time. It will get faster, like anything. Like lesson planning gets faster as you get used to doing it and better at it. So the same thing, you learn where you can fast forward ahead, where you can, okay, I see that this is not the part I'm gonna focus on, so I don't have to pay as much attention. And then there's those moments where, oh, this, this three minute section, this is where I'm gonna, want to focus my conversation with the teacher, let me watch that part twice. And, and so, I mean, we work with our coaches a lot on this process of like how to watch videos and plan, and it gets easier and better and faster. Do you, do you have tools specifically then to, like, as the coach, when I'm doing that, how, how to prepare? Yeah, we have, we have a planning guide and sort of a process for, for our model, and I think that a, a lot of the things that we ask coaches to think about as they're planning uh, would apply across contexts, but then for ours, we have some specifics as well, yeah. It's important to think about the policy and the practice wrapped around the video, right? Yeah. Uh, like, just like anything, you gotta think about implementation, you gotta think about who's, who you're engaging and how you're engaging them, and so I think, you know, part of the work is just figuring out what's, what's our expectation and how are we gonna communicate that, and, you know, we've seen a lot of schools or districts come out and say, okay, like, in a typical month, we want you to have four engagements. Week one is, is a self-reflection. Go for it. Week two is a peer-to-peer. -peer. So they're trying to manage the workflows for those involved or schedule them in ways that kind of help you manage that work because there's a lot of potential for this to feel overwhelming too, right? Um, because all of a sudden then everyone has access to a coach <laughs> um, and, and all, that could be overwhelming for a coach as well. So I think, you know, I think one of the big takeaways too that we've all learned is just think about the policy and the implementation pieces of this um, because they're critically important and, and the tech isn't going to solve that, right? The tech, tech should be a, a support to it, not not kind of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, the other thing that some of our coaches have said is that they've had to really sit down with administrators and schedulers in their building and, and come up with, okay, well, what is the crux of my job, right? If the crux of my job is 
observing and giving feedback to teachers, then I shouldn't have eight hours a day of other things right. where I have to do all my observation and feedback outside of school hours. And yes, other administrative things come up, but let's work on the schedule of your coaches to make sure that their time is spent coaching and not doing recess duty. Or yeah, be whatever. careful that video doesn't be kind of like, <laughs> I know you can do this after school, right. so I need you at lunch duty right now, right? <laughs> other questions from the group? Yeah, please. Um, I'm curious about your, your coach approach or the coach model that you use. Who are the thought leaders that inform how you Um, so, you know, around that question, we've been really intentional that the, the coaches in our small district report directly to the assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and assessment, and they each partner with a principal, but they've been really well trained that their time is to be spent with adults, helping adults improve practice. If a principal asks them to do recess duty or even take a small right remedial group of students, they're all really well trained to say, that's fine, have you spoken to Dr. Keene about that? They're not in the buildings, unless they're modeling a lesson for other educators, they really shouldn't be working directly with students. If that starts happening, especially if they're doing recess duty or administering assessments, right, then you're losing that multiplier effect. So we've been really jealous of the fact that they are professional developers. Um, they meet half of every Friday as a district-wide professional development team themselves. So while they're in a building all week long, every Friday afternoon they're out as a collaborative team focusing on their own learning and their own practice. We do follow a structured coaching model. We happen to use content-based coaching, but I think as long as you have a model, I think the worst thing you can do is pick a really talented classroom teacher, pull her away from students, and tell her go forth and coach. If they don't have the support and the training that they need, then you're crossing your fingers and hoping that they know how to tran and right having a skill and knowing how to transfer that skill are not the same things, and you, you need to be intentional about it. Yeah, our, we have our own model. It's called MQI coaching, and it was it grew out of our research. Um, and the MQI is our mass-specific observation rubric that was never intended to be a PD tool, and now it is because it accidentally worked that way. Um, but yeah, I agree. Like, pick a model, train your coaches, <laughs> give them their own professional support. Um. And very similar, because we do a content-based coaching model as well, and you're right, the coaches get trained in that, and then this is just an additional tool that they're using for that coach. What are some considerations when you think about the tech? I know in your program, you're tech agnostic, right? So you, you coach teachers on multiple different platforms, depending on what the district or school is using, and you're using advanced feedback. But when you think about the tech itself, what for the, for the group who's not using technology, what features, functionality, like what, what should people be thinking about as they examine this work? Because it's made your lives easier, better, made the coaching more effective. I think for us, don't overthink the tech. Everybody has a phone. And so we said that to our teachers, because at first, you know, we're coming in with cameras and mm -mm. so, but everybody has a phone and something to sit it on. And we started with that. Um, we've moved on to, um, actually it was when I was at the Harvard meeting and, and got Swivel, which is really cool. So if you find some dollars under a table somewhere, Swivel is absolutely awesome. But again, just something small as putting the phone on and, and putting it on the desk and getting it started is a way to get it started. Um, most schools have Wi-Fi, hopefully, somewhere, um, some faster than others, but just and in a way to upload it, and that's it. So when you, when you think about inside the technology, what features are helpful? Time you can do a bunch of stuff. Like, what do you find yourself using most? The time stamping, the sharing, kind of the video yeah, libraries? All, all of that. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the time stamping is like really awesome, because you're looking at the video and you're stopping. So wait, let me back up. Whatever framework rubric it is you're using to evaluate goes into the tool. Today I'm coming in and I'm looking at this particular domain and you can whittle it down to even that and then so as you're looking at that particular timestamp you can see that I see these characteristics here and you can add that to to the tool that goes back to the teacher. Um, you can 
pull out a piece of a video and put it in your resource library for your other teachers and let them know that it's there. Like, hey, this is a great way to start your warm up. Take a look. Um, you can add resources as possible to, for your teachers. So I guess I use all of it. Okay, there you go. I'll say that. Um I think the key thing for me with tech, because yeah, we will go into a district and if they already have something in place, we'll use what they have. If they don't, we can help them m make recommendations or choose um, tech products, both in terms of the camera setup that they want to use and in terms of the platform where they want to host the video. And um, I would say the main considerations for me at first are not about the features, which are all very nice, but it would be about teacher comfort and actually getting buy-in. And so I would be looking for, if I have teachers who are already comfortable with a particular platform or device, great, start there, because they don't need to add additional stressors. Um, also, teacher ownership of their own video. Mm -hmm. So like you were saying before, if I'm a teacher and I film a lesson and it was horrible, nobody else saw that automatically. Right. <laughs> I can delete it, I can never share it with anyone, I can film again the next period or the next day. And so having teachers control who sees their video and when, um, I think really helps with the trust component. So those would be my top two, like familiarity and comfort and then teacher ownership over their own video. And then after that, all the other features add, but I can work without any of the others as long as those two are there. And one of the first things that we did and, and was appreciated um, was we actually bought a simple little tripod device for each principal because they were just saying my phone keeps falling over. So right, they had the phone, we bought everybody a $20 arm so that they can hold it and that was huge. They were all thrilled. Um, I, I would say that having a platform is important. I, I wouldn't suggest trying to do your own, right? You don't want to, you don't want to try to use, um, you know, the, the iMovie and then record, being able to run the video, stop the video, mark the video, and okay. comment in the, another window is incredibly user friendly. And so like I said, even the less tech savvy folks in our team, it's a simple user friendly platform and if they're comfortable with it, then that, it's easy to share and, and that, that confidentiality component of it. They know that they control it. It's password protected. I can't go in and see their videos until they choose to share it with me. And if they'd rather share it with their peers first, they have that opportunity and functionality as well. And in your building, you have your super tech people, then you have your medium level people, and your people, <coughs> like you said, who have flip phones. And so the nice, the nice part about the tool is it's okay for everybody, even these people over here who are afraid to use it, because it's, it's easy. And, and they can ask questions about and get help without feeling like they don't know anything. Right. I want to share real quick, uh, Harvard's, well, predated visibly better was best foot forward. Um, and find this report very compelling too. So you can find these resources online. Best foot forward and visibly better are two that I would highly recommend, both out of Harvard's Center for Education Policy Research. Here are the top five findings they found coming out of that project. Educators felt more, found the observations to be more fair and productive. Scheduling is more convenient. Teachers were more self-reflective. Teachers more quickly overcame any hesitation with technology and more observations were conducted. So I wonder from your perspective, do anything, probably all of these ring true, but kind of did any of these ring true and surprise you? Um, are some of these not kind of coming to fruition in your context? Um, I'm definitely going to say the fair and more productive because it was a video. It wasn't my opinion as I was writing down things. It was what was there. And the way we use this for, because I did tell you this is all we do, um, it's totally about teacher growth. So we start in the beginning. We do the video. We have a conversation. And now in the April, May time frame, we have another conversation reviewing everything that's there and actually look to see has there been growth. The interesting part about it is there was some situations where there was none. And so then, you know, you have that other conversation about, you know, what do we need to do going forward? But it lets a teacher think about the fact that, wow, you expect me to grow. Yes, just like the teachers, and we're providing you that opportunity. Um, and then it also gives you an opportunity to, to see them more. 
more because because you know in the building you're running around doing a lot of different things but the video really gives you an opportunity to really observe what's going on in that classroom a lot more often Claire given that you've sat on the research side of this and probably were tied to this if not directly involved in all this work was there anything that came up that you all like kind of as you're just doing research thought huh wow we didn't expect this or I know these came from Harvard but anything <laughs> was anything surprising um, I think the um, I think the speed with which people overcame their hesitations was surprising to me like I assumed that there would be people who were into it and people who weren't and that there would be less movement <laughs> from one to the other um, but I think uh, we've seen that if you start somewhere and you have a couple of early adopters who are excited it is not that hard to then later roll out to other people you know you sort of show that it can be successful with some eager and willing people first and then uh, it's I expected more resistance for longer I guess and so that's the one that's been surprising to me and that's sort of held true across studies I mean some of the coaching work we do is is opt-in so we're not dealing with resistance in in that but um, and I, I recommend always starting with opt-in to build the, the buy-in even if you're eventually going to go to sort of this is what we do but um, we've had people be successful with without doing that even so I guess I've just been surprised that uh, there is still some resistance but it's less than I thought. I think that piece about self-reflection I know I've, I've mentioned it a couple times but I do think that this models the right m mindset that we're looking for right we want our, our classrooms to have students who are being self-reflective and willing to fail. And we have told teachers for a long time that we want them to be risk takers and want them to be self-reflective. Um, but you know, I think, I, I think about that t-ball dad, just yelling at the kid to hit the ball, but not helping them know how to do it doesn't make them better. This is a tool that we can hand to principals or coaches or teachers that doesn't just tell them to be self-reflective. It actually gives them a platform to do it and motivates the behavior. And so I think it does help to grow and model that, that growth mindset that we're talking about, but this gives you a way to get there. Advice, considerations when people are starting to get into this work. So if I'm thinking about doing this in my school or district, what should I be thinking about before I just jump into it? I would go back to what you said this morning, which is think about the why first. Like, it, it's not about the tech or the video, it's about what your goals are, and video is a tool to accomplish those goals. And so if what you want are students succeeding more, and if the lever you want to pull to achieve that is improving instruction, then how is video going to help you improve instruction? Because just throwing a piece of technology at a problem and expecting the fixes to happen automatically doesn't work. Um, so it's about the, the quality of the conversations that are happening around improving instruction, and it's about that growth that teachers are experiencing. And video is an incredibly powerful tool to accomplish that, but don't lose sight of the goal. I would agree with that. <laughs> um, teacher buy-in in, or principal buy-in is really important. And asking the teacher, the principal, whomever it is that's going to be participating in the work, is what do you want for yourself from your practice? Um, I, at the beginning of the school year, I always tell my teachers, I said, I would love it if we all stayed here for hundreds and hundreds of years, but we know that's not realistic, and especially not in this day and age. And so because, because we do this, this becomes part of their development plan. And so I say, if you find that dream job somewhere and you have to say, you know, I'm going to teach at the most brilliant school in the world, you have this video to take with you because this is part of your practice. This shows your growth. And so I let them know that it belongs to you as well as us, but it's all about you getting better. And if that's the conversation, it takes away all of the, the concern that, go, that may go around with it and saying, really, it's about you getting better, which ultimately means our children get what they need to get. Anything, Beth? 
I, I would agree with the opt-in, right? Being invitational with this, encouraging people to come to this rather than making this an edict. And you know, I think Pat was getting to that with how did you roll it out with the coaches. Um, you, you offer it as a tool, you invite people in, especially if you're talking about the large teacher cohort. Mm -hmm. I think starting at opt-in is an important place to be and it's exciting to hear that the resistance goes away quickly. Other questions from the group? For the good of the cause. So Claire and Catherine, if you don't mind, as we wrap up, can you talk a little bit about Visibly Better so folks understand kind of what it's about and what resources are available in the work? So we had a really, really great meeting at Harvard and actually looked at how using video is really going to change education. So it's it, what's interesting about it is using video in a lot of different places is, is, has a lot of different flavors. So if you come into a particular school district, you can't just say, oh, we're going to use video. There are a lot of legal implications, a lot of um, other players involved, things that can keep it from happening, but it's about agreeing that this actually makes sense. And so what, what happens is we have a lot of very like-minded folks getting together, looking at this practice and figuring out how we break down those barriers and make this something that really is going to be utilized because it's really about helping teachers get better. Yeah. So. I think it's really about this network of people doing the work in different ways and um, a way to connect with people who might have already gone through the challenges you're anticipating you will go through. And so if what you really want to focus on is how to build trust or do your very first rollout or pick a technology platform, there's somebody else in this visibly better network and community that has gone through that before. Um, and so I brought, there are some little cards that at the end you can pick up. There's little business cards that say visibly better on one side and have the website and email address um, on the other and then flyers with an overview of sort of the mission and goals and topics of the visibly better community. But really it is just a network for sharing because, I mean, we're all using video in different ways and we expect that those of you who use video will do it in different ways with some similarities and some differences. And so to be able to connect with lots of people and learn from people who've already made some mistakes and figured out tricks um, is really what it's about. So there are some more of both of these resources at the back, so as you leave, feel free to grab them. And I know that any time you've ever rolled out anything new in your school that was kind of just your idea and you're kind of fumbling along and there's nobody to talk to, and the nice part about Visibly Better is everybody is very willing to share with you a lot of the, the resources that we have, the mistakes that we've made, and, and we've learned that networking is so important, and this is a great network for this. There are a ton of resources on their site. I would highly recommend it. Even if you're not doing this work, just go on and poke around because, yeah, and it's, it's, it's the only one I can think of actually that's been so comprehensive in its approach. And what's cool is it's like resources from Harvard and then resources from all the folks in the network who just want to contribute to the thinking around the work, who want to be supportive in the work. And we, you know, we get convenience like this, but we don't get that opportunity often. And so it's nice to see that community kind of take shape online because it just, it's, be, it's helpful. So I would highly recommend going to the site um, because it'll give you a lot of the stuff you need so you don't kind of stumble through some of the th same things that folks have stumbled through. But they'll have just planning documents and rubrics and things that will just help kind of shift your thinking or kind of help you think more comprehensively about this work. Any other questions before we wrap? Well, can you give our panelists a hand, please? <laughs> <laughs>